Well, good evening. All right. <clears throat> Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. Begin reading tonight with verse number 8. 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture here tonight, and as we once again look into your Word and glean the truths from this passage that you would have us to glean tonight as we look in on this letter that you had Paul penned to his son in the faith, Timothy, that, Lord, the, what Paul wanted to emphasize to him, he would emphasize to us this evening, that, Holy Spirit, you'd be our teacher tonight and that you would minister to each and every heart and illuminate us, Lord, that we could behold wondrous things out of your word this evening. Help us, we pray. Bless our study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the key word, really, that starts this section off is that first word of verse 8. Remember. Remember. Uh, again, he ends it in verse 14 by saying, of these things, put them in remembrance. Okay, so these are things that you want to remember. In fact, Jesus in John 16 verse 4 said, These things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you them. Acts 20 and verse 31, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Again in verse 35, he told them, I've showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words, the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. In Hebrews 13, he says, remember them that are in bonds. In Hebrews 13, verse 7, remember them that have the rule over you. Over and over again, Paul is reminding us that there's things we have to remember. Uh, it's so easy not to remember. Isn't it? Uh, sometimes we hear something and we think it, it's not necessarily something new, but it's something that we have forgotten. Uh, we heard it before, but we didn't remember it. Uh, I'm getting to the age now where people say, yeah, remember when you, when you told me this? I'm like, I told you that? <laughs> I don't remember that. And I don't doubt them anymore. I don't say, no, I don't say I didn't say it. I just, uh, I just believe I probably don't remember saying that. And it's easy to forget. One fellow went to the doctor and he said, I got a terrible time. I just, I just can't remember anything. I forget when I go into a room, forget what I went there for. I don't remember where my car keys are. I just, I just can't remember anything. Do you have any advice for me? And the doctor said, yeah, pay in advance. <laughs> Make sure I get my money. But uh, remember, there's things that all of us, we have to, it's so easy to let the things of God slip. And, and, and we don't recall them and remember them like we are. And so we have to have repetition. And so here's some things that Paul has said, Timothy, you need to remember, okay? First one is verse 8. It, remember that the gospel includes the resurrection. He says in verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So the, if you don't know the gospel, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you turn over there with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll come back to 2 Timothy 2, of course. But 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives a defense of the gospel. You understand, all of 1 Corinthians is corrective. 
Uh, the church at Corinth was not the church you'd want to pattern your church after. Uh, there were many, many problems there. In fact, he took all 16 chapters just correcting problems. The second Corinthians is more instruction. Now we can give them some instruction about how they should live. But boy, the first is full of correction. And here, he's trying to straighten them out on the resurrection. Uh, most of chapter 15 is dealing with the resurrection. But he starts with the gospel. Notice he says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ, here it is, you ready? How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that's the Gospel. And let me help you out with something. That's the full Gospel, okay? It says, are you a full Gospel church? Yes. All right? Uh, it doesn't mean that you speak in tongues. That's what sometimes they mean by that. But the full Gospel is right there. There's nothing. Don't add anything to it. Don't take away from it. But it's not just the death of Christ. It's not just the burial of Christ. It is the resurrection of Christ. Uh, you need all three uh, to have the gospel. Uh, turn back to your left a little bit further to the book of Romans. Would you please? Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Here he's talking about Abraham and how what, when he believed God... That it was in verse number 2, it said, I'm sorry, 22, Romans 4, verse 22, that in therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. That's, that, that, that's Abraham believing God. Now watch verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. Well, then why was it written? Well, verse 24, for us also. He wrote that so we could read it. To whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who, Jesus, was delivered for our offenses, but raised again for our justification. See, the Bible, he went on to say in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, if Christ isn't risen, we're still in our sins. We have no hope at all. So it's important that, that the resurrection is always included. In fact, listen, a dead person can't save anybody. He has to be a living Savior. And he conquers death and he conquers sin, so we'll be able to conquer death and sin. Because he lives, we also should live. We serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today. And so Hebrews chapter 7, when you go to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25, that's on the other side of Timothy, if you're looking that up. Hebrews 7 and verse number 25. The Bible talks about how he ever liveth. They're talking about Jesus now and comparing him to Melchizedek from the Old Testament. And it says, This man, verse 24, speaking of Jesus, because he continueth forever, or continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he, talking about Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. So He rose from the dead, He conquered death, that's part of the gospel, and now He lives and He's at the right hand of God. And what's He do? He makes intercession for us. He's our intercessor. He's the one, there's one intercessor between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. He's the one. And so the gospel has to include the resurrection, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember that. Remember that, okay? Number two, back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. The second thing he wants Timothy to remember is this. Timothy, when you live the gospel, you will suffer trouble. <laughs> Boy, that's encouraging, isn't it? Notice chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 12. You notice where Paul said, well, remember in verse 11, we talked about how he's appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And then verse 12 says, For the which cause I also, what? 
suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. For the which cause I also suffer these things. You go on to chapter 2 and verse 3. We talked last week about, Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You go on through here and you find out they're suffering. If we suffer with Him, he says later on, and we'll cover tonight, we shall reign with Him. Remember, where's Paul writing this from? Prison. His last place he'll have before his head's cut off. And, and his first answer, no man stood with him. And I wonder, Timothy's a young man. He's looking at Paul and Paul is imparting to him these things. I wonder if Timothy thinks, am I looking at my future? Nero has got Paul. I'm sure it's only a matter of time before he'll get me. Am I looking at what I'm headed for? And Paul just, he, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, try to hide the elephant in the room. He tries to say, hey man, you, you live for God, you're going to suffer. Now, that's hard for Americans to understand. Because we don't, have, we don't suffer at all for Jesus in America. There's a good spot for an amen there, folks. Okay, are you awake? You with me? We just don't. We have no idea what, what a lot of this world uh, has to suffer. You know, notice what Paul said, and I'm going to come to, back to that in just a minute. Notice what he said, verse 9, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. He said, even, that's why I'm in prison. Uh, they're, they're calling me an evildoer. What was he doing? Preaching the gospel. There'll come a time, he said, when you're going to be called an evildoer just because you stand for what's right. I think we're there in America. It's unbelievable. And so the world will think that of a Bible-believing Christian. If you live the gospel at work, you'll suffer some at work. If you live the gospel at home, you'll suffer some at home. If you live the gospel in your neighborhood, you'll suffer some in your neighborhood. Some suffer socially. They're considered outcasts for their faith. I was reading about a man who was in Spain who is now with the Lord. This goes back a few years. His name was Jose Boris. Jose was a Roman Catholic priest. And as the story I was reading goes, he was given the assignment of studying the Baptists to find out why they were wrong so he could teach other Roman Catholics how to refute their doctrine. And he began to study what the Baptists believe, and he actually made an appointment with a Baptist preacher in town to interview him about his faith. And of course, in the course of that interview, and as he spoke with the Baptist pastor, the pastor gave him the gospel, shared with him the plan of salvation from the Word of God. And, 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 and that it's salvation is by faith through grace, but by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jose, as he looked at the Scriptures, he began to realize that what he was seeing was true. And under deep conviction of the Holy Spirit, he prayed to receive Christ as his Savior and was wonderfully saved. Well, he went back to his bishop and he was immediately dismissed from the priesthood and put out on the street with nothing more than the clothes on his back. Still a young man at the time, he said he returned to his parents' home and when he knocked on the door, his mother, a devout Roman Catholic, answered the door and he asked if he could come in and she said, I no longer have a son. He died and slammed the door in his face. The pastor who led him to the Lord took him in and Jose Boris went on to become a, one of the leading pastors in Spain reaching his people for Christ. But it didn't come without having to pay a price for his faith. So some people suffer socially for that. Remember in Bible colleges a few years ago, a, guy, a fellow was saved out of a Jewish background in a very similar situation. He would try to call home to his mom and dad, and his, his, his mom would say, we have no son. Our son died. They actually had a funeral service with a coffin and everything to say our son Ed died because he got saved and was called to the ministry, and he was in Bible college. And they, they completely treated him as if he were dead. You, you, some people pay a price. Other people may suffer economically. You have certain parts of this country, if you're in, if you're in Utah and you're not a Mormon, you'll suffer business-wise. You'll suffer economically if you're in business and you're just a Christian. You, they, they won't patronize your business. They'll patronize the Mormon who has a business. 
and not you for being a Christian. We've seen, we've seen people suffer economically with, and, and all kinds of, when, when they won't bake a cake for someone who wants them to uh, promote their homosexuality or their uh, whatever lifestyle they want to make. You see, and people have to take their stand and they suffer. Some people suffer physically. Paul suffered physically. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where he talks about all the physical things he went through. The beatings and the scourgings and the, the night and the day in the deep and, and, and uh, beaten with rods and on and on and on it goes. We know he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. So he's just trying to let Timothy know, I want you to know, uh, this, this, uh, you better be prepared to suffer. When you live for the gospel, you're going to suffer. And listen, if the Lord tarries his coming, we'll see that happen. We'll see that happen even in the United States of America. Already you're seeing what happens and, and, and some on the, the, the uh, liberal side of things in America, how violent they're becoming. You can't even eat at a restaurant or you can't even uh, eat certain things, or go certain places. They're just in your faith blocking traffic and standing in front of your car. And, and so you have to be prepared for that. It won't just be because you're politically on the right It'll just be because you're biblically on the right. That day may come. And so you have to understand. But listen, it's okay. If Jesus suffered, uh, is the disciple above his master? Is the student above his teacher? If Jesus suffered and Paul suffered and Peter had to suffer and these men suffered, who are we? That we wouldn't suffer at all for the cause of Jesus Christ. If I can be in that company of believers, I'll... I'm in good company. Okay? Number three. Here's the third thing to remember, Timothy. The third thing is found in the, in the, uh, the very end of the verse. He says, Whereas I suffer as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but notice, but the word of God is not bound. Number three is the messenger may be bound, but the word of God is not bound. Oh, there are times when you and I may be bound. And here Paul was bound. He was, he was chained to a soldier. So he's limited in, in who he can talk to and who he can get out to. Uh, but he said the Word of God isn't bound. It, 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 it'll always accomplish uh, what it wants to. There's times that you and I can get bound. You ever, uh, we, we, don't, we don't use the word bound, but we use the word tied. You, ever, you ever, ever have somebody, you ever get in that situation where you say, man, I was just tongue tied? Huh? Or we want to do something and we'd like to do something, but we say, well, my hands are tied. See? There's times we're bound and we just can't do what we'd like to do or what we'd want to do. But the Word of God never is bound. The Word of God always is, is, is not bound by circumstances. The Word of God is not bound by situation. The Word of God is not bound by criticism. The Word of God is not bound by scholarship. It's limitless, it's omnipotent, it's infinite, it's the Word of God. It's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. God said, my Word will go forth and it will always accomplish the purpose for which I send it. The Word of God's never bound. And so, continue to remember, remember Timothy, the Word of God is never bound. You can, Paul is saying, Timothy, you can shut up the messenger but you'll never shut up the message. You can't. The Word of God will continue. You can't shut up the book He preaches from. So He's saying, here's what you do. Therefore, because the Word of God's not bound, Timothy, therefore, verse 10, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So He's saying, you keep going. Endure. There's that word endure again. So you keep going. If the word of God's not bound, you keep going. Three factors in keeping going. Three factors in enduring. Number one is the word of God. Because it will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. We can keep going because the word of God will never fail. It's the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So the weapon we have, it's eternal. It's, it's omnipotent, it's all-powerful, it, where people are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Back in the 1800s, 
in England when Moody and Tory were holding meetings. They would often hold meetings in the big uh, halls over there in London that would seat uh, almost 10,000 people, and they'd pack them out. In fact, they had to give tickets out, not, not for buying, but you'd have a ticket to get in so they wouldn't overcrowd the place. And oftentimes there's many people outside as there were inside. But so they, what they did to try and reach some of the lost, they would actually hold atheist meetings. And you would only come in if you were a professed atheist, you didn't believe in God. And so, well, what are they going to talk to him about? Would they, did they tell him some convincing story? Did they uh, come up with some great illustration to get him to think about what they were doing? No, you know what they did? They just gave him Scripture. They just quoted Scripture to them and challenged them to go home and read the Gospel of John. And they had, when they would stay for two and three weeks, they had atheists coming back and receiving Christ as their Savior. Why? The power of the Word of God. When someone says, I don't believe the Bible, the best thing to do is use it on them anyway. It really is. It's, it's not my argument's going to convince you to believe the Bible. The Bible itself. If I'm holding a gun in my hand and you say, I don't believe in guns, you know what I'm going to do? I'll just shoot you and then you'll believe in it. Okay? Now you'll be a believer. I'll use it. You'll see that it works. But it, listen, this is the gospel gun. It works. Just give it. it. It's the Word of God that will penetrate the heart. It's the Word of God that will break up that hard heart. And so just give them the Scripture. Don't think, well, I don't have any words to say. Use God's words. Use God's words. And it's the Word of God. So I endure and because of the Word of God. I endure, secondly, because of the souls of mankind. He says, I'm going to endure... He said, all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And when he talks about the elect's sake, he could be referring to his people, the, the Jews. Uh, Paul said his heart's desire is that his own people would come to know Christ as his Savior. In fact, he had such a burden at one time, he was willing to be accursed that they might be saved. He says, I want to keep going because I want them to be saved. Don't, don't. Don't take ever election as uh, God has chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. Okay? There's so many scriptures in the Bible that plainly teach that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's so many scriptures in the Bible that says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That he will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And you can't take the plain scriptures and throw them out on one that you're not sure what it means. And, and all I know is, listen, when there's an election, that means somebody's got to vote. An election means you get to vote. And so he's saying, I'm praying they'll, they'll vote. When, when you have an election, we have one coming up here in, in less than a month, then you've got to go cast your ballot. You've got to cast your vote. And so we cast your vote for Christ. D.L. Moody used to say, the elect or the whosoever wills, and the non-elect or the whosoever wants. Okay? I believe that. I, believe that. I don't think that, well, you don't need to witness to that guy. I mean, if, listen, if, if, if they're going to get saved anyway because they're pre-chosen by God, why do I have to even give the gospel to them? They're going to get saved whether I witness to them or not. Doesn't matter. And so got Paul saying, no, I want them to obtain, so I'm going to continue. I, listen, he says, I want to pass this gospel of Jesus Christ to the next generation and then to the generations to follow. I want them to have faith in Jesus Christ. And I can't do that if we don't endure. So I endure for the word of God's sake. I endure for the souls of mankind. And then I endure because of eternal rewards. He says, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, that they may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Eternal rewards. I, I'm not just uh, giving the gospel to them to, so I can say, okay, I got this many saved. He says, no, I want to see them rooted and grounded uh, in the faith. I want to, uh, Paul told the church at Thessalonica that uh, you're our crown. You're, our, you're my rejoicing when I see the Lord. Uh, that's who I'm going to rejoice over because of what you've allowed God to do in your life. And so those, with, with those eternal glory, with that eternal glory, eternal rewards in mind, then you go to verse 11. And he says this, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. 
That's Galatians 2.20. What's Galatians 2.20 say? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so it's Galatians 2.20. It's I'm being dead with him, dead to self and alive to Christ. Dead to the, to the things of this world and alive to Jesus Christ. Allowing Christ to live through me. That's what John the Baptist meant when he said, He must increase and I must decrease. The idea isn't it, it isn't that Christ isn't living in us, is that there's, we're so full of us, nobody sees Him. And so he said, we've got to be willing to die. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Dying to self, being crucified with Christ. And then we'll live with Him. Number two, notice the next thing he says. Verse number 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Now we know, we talked about suffering. In fact, he'll tell Timothy later on that all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. There's no getting around it. But you've got to understand that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. One day, the Lord Jesus is going to come back. Now listen, He's coming back for the rapture. That's the snatching away of the believers. And that will begin what's called a tribulation period here on earth, a seven years that the Bible calls the time of Jacob's trouble, where once again, God will not just judge this world, but He'll be dealing with His people Israel. Uh, right now, Israel is set aside, and God is dealing with the church. That's us. That's why we call that the church age. But when the church is taken out at the rapture, God will call us out. He's once again going to deal with Israel. And this is going to be a horrible time on the earth of God's judgment upon man and God's judgment upon sin for seven years. At the end of those seven years, we're coming back with Him. You read about that in Revelation chapter 20. We're coming back with Him. And when He comes back, we're going to put down the forces of, of Antichrist at that time. And Jesus Christ is going to set up a 1,000 year reign on this earth. 1,000 years, he's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. Well, how's he going to do that? Who's going to, who's going to be in the United States during that time? Hmm? I'm going to be in the Oval Office. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably be a street cleaner somewhere in Grove City, but I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to be reigning with him. Believers. But we reign with Him if we suffer for Him. That's why I think, you know, most of us Americans that live in this generation, we're way down the list of who's going to be reigning. Because we haven't suffered like those who've gone before us have had to suffer. Certainly those who were thrown to the lions and those who were burned at the stake and uh, those folks that you read about in history. But if we suffer, we'll reign with Him. But now, listen, now's not crowning time. Now is cross-bearing time. Now's not the time for the crown. Now's the time for the cross. And we bear our cross daily. We suffer now in order to reign later. And Paul looked forward to that, I'm sure. Then he goes on to say at the end of verse 12, if we deny Him, He also will deny us. And boy, how, how people have wrestled over this one. Those who think you can uh, somehow wiggle out of your salvation that you get. They, they say, well, there it is. See, if you deny Him, then He'll deny you. But I want to remind you, what is the context of He's talking about here? He's talking about eternal rewards. He's talking about eternal glory. He's not talking about your salvation. And so He's talking about rewards. He's talking about reigning with Christ. Uh, in, in Luke 19... And look, uh, turn over there, if you will. Luke 19, it's a parable Jesus told, and you're familiar with it. It's the parable of the pounds. I had a sermon I preached on this passage one time, and I, I called it, God wants you to gain pounds. Huh, nobody came to hear it. They figured they all had enough weight on them, you know. They didn't want to get 
Tell me how to lose pounds, you know. But uh, it, the Bible says here in Luke 19, he, he trying to see if I want to read the whole thing or not. But, you know, it's, it's similar to the parable of the talents, but it's towns, it's pounds. Notice, let's, let's go back. Verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to what? Reign. To what? Reign over us. This is about reigning. This is about uh, servants and, and giving, the, giving them the, the pounds. It, came, it says it came to pass that when he was turned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded those servants to be called to him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much Every man had gained by trading. And of course he came to the first, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, thou have thou authority over ten cities. It's not about salvation, it's about reigning. It's about ruling. The second came, said, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said, Likewise then, be thou also over five cities. And then the last guy, of course, he laid it up in a napkin and... Um, and then, of course, the Lord judges him for that. And he ended up taking away from him who had the one and gave it to the one who had ten. Okay? But it's not talking about salvation here. It's talking about reigning. It's talking about ruling over cities. And so, it's not about salvation. It's about stewardship. When the Lord says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, we have an example of it in the Bible. Can you think of anybody who maybe we've studied recently in the last few months that denied he knew Jesus Christ? Oh, that's a pretty famous guy. Denied he knew him. I don't know the man. Blankety blank blank. Started cussing like a fisherman, like a sailor. And of course at that point, he's gone. He's done. The Lord threw him away, didn't he? No, he did not. No, he did not. Because that's, see, the, now we're talking about somebody's salvation. And that's why he put the next phrase in, in verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Why? He cannot deny himself. See, if we believe not, he still abides faithful. He can't deny himself. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Is he going to deny that statement? Is he going to go back on that? Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5. I know Ephesians 5 normally is uh, the passage we look to when it comes to marriage and a husband and a wife. Galatians, Ephesians 5. But there's something very important here that, you, that we ought to notice. When he talks about men in verse 28, ought to love their wives as their own bodies, and he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Watch now, for we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. Who's we? That's us. So if Christ denies us, what's he denying? His own body, his own flesh, his own bones. So he says he cannot do that. So he abides faithful. It doesn't matter if you, you put your faith and trust in Christ and down the road you want to uh, recant, deny that. It's too late for that. We talked about when you enlist in the army of the Lord. How long is that enlistment for? Uh, yeah, it's forever. No, no three year hitches, no five year stints, no 20 year retirements. It's, it's forever, okay? And so, if you, if he abides faithful. Timothy, Paul would say, remember, the worst they can do is kill you and you go to heaven. You can't, you can't lose, okay? I read this, I thought it was pretty good. It said, when you were born, everyone else was smiling and you were crying. Live so that when you die, everyone else is crying and you're smiling. Isn't that good? 
I read this this week. Some, uh, a preacher said, I'd like this, this to say this on my tombstone. Husband, father, pastor to God's people, preacher of God's word, believer in Jesus Christ. And it's that last line that's most important. For people to see that. You ever walk through the cemetery and read, read tombstones? Some of you do that. When you're gone, it's good for people to remember you believed in Jesus Christ. Because then you haven't lived in vain. You know, you, I've been to many funerals through the years. You've lived, lived very long. You've been to quite a few yourself. And it always, it's always cringeworthy to me to hear him talk about he loved this, he loved that, he did this, he was active in this, and nobody ever mentions Jesus Christ. Nobody ever mentions that he loved the Lord. Nobody ever mentions that he talked to him about the Savior. And so, don't, don't waste your life like that. Let people know that you believe in Jesus Christ. So far in chapter 2, we're messengers, we're soldiers, we're athletes, we're farmers. We have a living Savior. We'll suffer trouble as we live for Him. And that may bind us, but it won't bind the Word of God. The Word of God will continue to grow and to go forward. And so we're to keep going and we're to endure because there's eternal rewards to gain. For the Word's sake, for the souls of men's sake, and for eternal glory's sake. And then there's one more thing he reminds them of in verse 14. He said, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Don't strive about the word. Believe the word. Don't get into arguments about the Bible. Titus 1 and verse 1, right after 2 Timothy, is Titus, Titus, another preacher that Paul is training. And he, again, uses this, this talking about some unruly and vain talkers and deceivers in verse 10. And he says in verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. What's filthy lucre, church? Yeah, for money's sake. Doing it for a profit. You know, that, that if you don't get anything from this, and I think I might have missed it earlier, but you know, the, this idea of health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is not in the Bible. Health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is not in the Bible. Okay? It's not taught. You did, Jesus didn't know anything about it. Paul didn't know anything about it. That's a, that's a phenomenon that has come on in the affluency of our world. He's saying, here's some people that were subverting. Subvert means this, to bring you under the control and authority of someone other than God. Subvert is when they bring you under the control and authority of someone other than God. You're not... You can come to the pastor and get advice and to get counsel. But ultimately, you're responsible to God, not the pastor. And, and you have to understand, uh, my, the pastor's job is to point you to God. Not point you to me. Not point you, I, I, I don't want you under my control. I want you under God's control. I want you in control of the Holy Spirit of God. And He indwells you just like He indwells me. And so, be, be careful. Don't, don't rely on scholarship. Because then I'll have to rely on a man to tell me God's Word. There are people who say we don't have, you know, we only have God's Word in the Greek and the Hebrew. Well, then I have to rely on someone who knows Greek and Hebrew to tell me what God's Word is. Well, then who is my faith in? Is my faith in God's Word? Is my faith in that guy telling me God's Word? See? Then I have to rely on his scholarship. And he may tell me right, or he may tell me wrong, or he may tell me, let's all fly down to Ghana, South Africa, and drink Kool-Aid. Some of you are old enough to remember what that was all about. 
That was subversion. That was bringing them under His control, not under God's control. And so, rely on the words of the Bible and the author of the words of the Bible. That's who you rely upon. Now, that'll lead us right into verse 15 where we'll start next week where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And we'll say some interesting things about that passage when we get there next week, okay? All right, let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Lord, for this epistle to 2 Timothy that you had Paul pen. <clears throat> I pray that we'll remember these things that you have wanted to put us in remembrance of as you did Timothy. And Lord, we're thankful for your faithfulness to us. We're thankful for the power of the Word of God. That it's impossible for it to be bound. And I pray that each of us would endure and we'd continue on and we'd be faithful to you even if we suffer a little bit. Even if it gets hard, I pray you would keep us faithful. For faithful is he who's called us who also will do it. We love you, Lord. We thank you for people who come to church on a Wednesday night when the only attraction is to study your word together. Lord, I pray your blessing on each individual here this evening and dismiss us with your care now. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.